This is Coach Rick, and welcome to the Bald Truth Leadership Podcast, a place where you get the straightforward, no-nonsense, no-hold-barred ideas on leadership and growth, both personally and professionally. The Bald Truth Leadership Podcast is brought to you every week by the Peak Performance Group. I'm your host, Coach Rick Colster, certified executive business coach and the chief coaching officer of the Peak Performance Group, where we help people and organizations align and maximize their potential. Folks, today, our guest is one of those guys we all want to grow up and be. I got to tell you that. He's one of the masterminds and partners of one of the fastest growing and largest family friendly and focused restaurants in the world. He's a leader, an expert in logistics and transportation, as well as a world traveler, and as he likes to call himself, an adventure aficionado. Welcome to the Bald Truth, one of the former owners of CeCe's Pizza, now retired and chasing those dreams, Robert Bob Kulik. Welcome to the Bald Truth, Bob. We're glad you're here. Thank you, Coach Rick. It's good to be here. Well, it's good to be here. It's a great day. It's uh, here in Texas, as we always are. Let's see, where do we start? I mean, gosh, you've got so much stuff that you've done. We were chatting before we, we started recording. It's hard to pick a starting point. Um, yeah. Let's jump in. Um, so you, you started your career, um, in the pizza business, your your major part of your career in the pizza business. How long were you in it? And what were you thinking when you first started out with CC's pizza? Well, I was, I was 20 years with CC's. Um, prior to that, I'd been in the restaurant industry my whole career since I left college. And I started out, a, a lot of people may know, very famous, I guess, because of South Park, uh, Casa Bonita in Denver. Uh, big, big restaurant up there. I was okay. a manager at that restaurant. Uh, they transferred me down to Dallas to the corporate headquarters. I uh, worked there as um, director of purchasing for uh, what at that time was Unigate restaurants. Uh, it was Casa Bonita, Taco Bueno, Crystal's Pizza, Black Eyed Pea, and Dixie House. So uh worked for them oh, for man, a I love years. the Black Eyed Pea. I'd always go there. I got to go on New Year's Day, right? Get your Black Eyed oh, Peas. Yeah. Exactly. You'd be good luck all year long. So, uh, you know, I, yes. and I, when I moved to Texas in 82, I, ne- I never heard of Black Eyed Peas. I got to tell you. Yeah. So where are we from? Like, what the heck is this tradition? But yeah. it served we're, me well for the last, what's that? Oh, gosh, 40 plus years almost. Yeah. Where did you move from? New Jersey. Okay. See, so yeah, I, I moved from the Chicago area. And same thing. Yeah. It's like Black Eyed Peas. What are, what are Black Eyed Peas? What is this thing? <laughs> See, I thought I was John Travolta. I moved from New Jersey to Texas, and I, first thing I stopped at was, of course, Gillies. I moved to Houston. So. Oh, of course, yeah. That's my yeah. story. <laughs> I'm sticking to it. <laughs> Didn't quite work out as well for you as it did for John Travolta, but that's okay. Yes. I don't know. I got a good-looking gal. You know, I chased no, no, I've seen you. Of, I, never I mind. We won't go there. I've seen you dance. That's, that's well, that's true. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, all my family says, don't do that. Yeah. Don't do that, Dad. <laughs> that's good. So, all right, so uh, when you first started out with CC's, what was the vision? I, I want two things I want to I'm curious about is what were you thinking getting into the pizza business? But really what I want to know is what's the vision? Yeah. Well, what, what was really cool about it? I was, I was just finishing up a gig up in Chicago after I left Unigate restaurants, went up to Chicago, uh, did a turnaround in a small bakery cafe chain called Warburton's Bakery Cafe. Um, and so basically worked myself out of a job there. I was looking around, a guy contacted me and say, said, you gotta meet this guy, Joe Croce. He just started this little pizza restaurant uh, called CeCe's Pizza. There's about 15 of them in Dallas, Fort Worth. You gotta talk to this guy. So came down to Dallas, sat down and talked to Joe. It was supposed to be a two hour meeting. Uh, something like eight hours later, we walked out of the, <laughs> the uh, office and I went back to uh, Chicago and I said, he's gonna offer me the job and I'm gonna take it. Uh, like I said, it was a small, it, at the time when I started, the corporate headquarters was Joe, me, and a receptionist, and that was it. And we had, when when I actually started, there were twenty restaurants all in Dallas Fort Worth. I r- was uh, brought on to run JMC Restaurant Distribution, which was the distribution arm of the company. So my experience had been in in restaurants, so I knew restaurants, uh, and I knew distribution, but not running a distribution company. So we had one beat up old truck, uh, one little um, less than 10,000 square foot warehouse, and we delivered to all the restaurants. And so over the years, we just took it from that to 
Uh, when we got up to about 400 restaurants, Joe decided he wanted to spend time with his family and his church, and he sold the company to me and a couple of other guys. Uh, we took it then to 600, or just over 600 restaurants, sold it to a, a private equity firm, and in the course of it, it took that JMC from one beat-up truck to uh, about 100 trucks, three distribution centers, uh, running to 33 states or across the country, and 611 stores we had at the height and uh, so it was, it was a lot it was the most fun I've ever had in any job anywhere just just taking something from basically nothing to what it came to be well it's 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 like the American dream it, you you put yeah. your head down put hard work in and mm -hmm. you grew something from you know and Joe had the the vision I guess to I don't know he did, if he saw 600 but yeah. he, he had the vision of Hey, family friendly pizza, you know, cause I right. love going, I used to take my kids there all the time. I try not to eat too much pizza. No, no, no offense, but you know, <laughs> you know where pizza goes and guys my age, you know, it goes right. the button. so I'm trying to stay away, but it was great. You had great friendly food. Um, yeah. you had healthy, healthy options too. So yeah. it was really made a nice mix. Well, and what you said too, you know, you put your head down, you work hard, all that's true, but another factor that I think was really key to our success is we had fun. I mean, that was one thing. I, every employee that I brought onto the organization, I told them, if you're not having fun, please leave. That this, this culture isn't for everybody, and there's going to be people that look at this and go, hey, you know, you guys are crazy. And there were people that said that. But in the meantime, you know, I mean, one, one good example, I still hear about this from people within the organization. I've been, I've been retired for eight years now. But I had this plastic sword in my office. And one day, I don't even know why, but I went running out into the lobby because I would always give the receptionist a hard time. I went running into the lobby with a sword in hand, slid across the tile in front of her desk and had the sword out. And she looks at me and goes, uh, Bob, your two o'clock interview is here. He's a little bit early. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm standing there with this plastic sword in my hand. I turn around and go, oh, hi, welcome. Come on back. And he told me I ended up hiring him. He told me later, he says, as soon as you slid across the, the floor that, that uh, afternoon, he said, I knew I want to work for this guy. <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> and that's, that's kind of fun. Business yeah. has got to be fun. I think business yeah. has got to be fun. And, you know, there's a serious side to it. I mean, because you've got, you know, you've got to maintain um, quality. You've yeah. got to build, um, you know, quant quality distribution's got to happen. You got to make sure you're on time. The logistics have to work. There's a lot of nuts and bolts behind it, but yeah. you're absolutely right. Fun. If you ain't having fun, why the heck are you doing it? I think yeah. that's the question we have to ask ourselves is if you're not having fun, why are you doing this? But you see, it's funny because you, you talk about that and you, yeah, you get all those things you have to hit, but when you're having fun, it's so much easier to hit them. One of the things I, you know, I'm, I'm not real bright. So it, it took me 10 years or so after, you know, I, I'm in the pizza business, but mainly in the distribution business. And it finally dawns on me one morning when I have three distribution centers across the country and all these trucks run. My main business is distribution. It's not pizza. Uh, and I, you know, I, I was always a member of the National Restaurant Association, go to their meetings and all that. Sure. So I joined the American Trucking Association and started going okay. to their conventions and learning about them. First convention I went to, it was talking to one of the, the big wigs in the organization and he goes, uh, yeah, I understand you're new to the organization. What do you find is your biggest problem within your distribution? And I said, well, one of my biggest problems is the drivers are getting older. You know, they stay on and they can't do the physical work. So we're trying to find spots for them to within the organization because we don't want to lose them because they're great. And the guy stops and he goes, wait, your biggest problem is you don't have driver turnover? I said, oh, yeah, our driver. I said, we have drivers that have been with us, you know, 15 years and all this stuff. And he, he goes and grabs the president of the organization, brings him over and says, you got to get this guy on stage. Found out their biggest problem was driver turnover. Oh, know? yeah. Drivers are turning over in nine months. And for ours, they're staying 10, 15 years. And we're going, man, you know, he's 60 years old and he can't lift, uh, you know, 40,000 pounds worth of material every night anymore. Uh, what are we going to do with this guy? And, and a lot of it had to do with having fun and and treating everybody is, you know, you see so many organizations out there that say, you know, people are a number one asset and then ignore them. Yeah. And my deal was, you know, yeah, people are a number one asset. Enjoy them. You know, yeah. let's, that, let's you know what? go out and yeah. 
people are people our listeners are really going to love this because we got i've got a real big presence in the construction concrete specifically industry so biggest turnover where do we find drivers where are they turning over why are they going to the competition for a dollar more mm -hmm. you know a dollar more yeah. an hour you and i both know a dollar more an hour is doesn't doesn't no, mean a lot right but to, to a guy who's working paycheck to paycheck yeah that may mean that may mean you know that's 40 bucks and 40 bucks a week where he can yeah. buy dog food for his dog where he couldn't before or you know do something for his kids on he can buy mm -hmm. go to cc's for 40 bucks yeah you can't go to cc's for 40 bucks <laughs> yeah can i give you a little secret that i i used yeah i i, I give did us this a little because, secret yeah because i i thought it was the right thing to do and then i learned later really what it did for my my team is on there any of the district any any of the three distribution centers that hired a new person on, I would ask them to get some basic information. You know, the person's name, spouse, kids, hobbies, sure. you know, things like that. And say, when you're about to hire, when you hire them, send me that information. I would then write a handwritten note to that employee, welcoming them to the team, uh, putting one of my business cards in as the president and owner of the company, and saying, if there's ever anything I can do for you, don't hesitate to contact me. And, oh, by the way, I understand you're a motorcycle rider. I'm a big motorcycle rider, too. Hopefully, one of these times when I'm out in Atlanta, we might be able to go riding together or something like that. So let them know. I'm, it's not just a generic letter. It's to that person. And understand your your wife, Beverly, is, uh, you know, does so-and-so and, you know, that type of thing. And I would make a point to send it to their home prior to them starting. And... I would hear afterwards, a lot of the spouses would open this up and go, you, you get a letter from the president of the company welcoming you to the team. You get, you know, the, the owner just sent you a note. And that was one of the things that would just blow them away going, this is a different company than any other one they've, they've ever been with, you know. And that that's, and same I thing. think is a lost art, Bob. That's a, yeah. that is totally a lot. We don't write handwritten letters anymore. Emails, hell, we barely write emails. Or it's text messaging right, right now. But I mean, yeah. I, I've come up myself as well. I try to write at least one or two a day to it's whoever great. I talk to, someone I chatted with, you know, the, if I have their yeah. home address, I'll mail it to them, you know, work address mm -hmm. if it's work. But it's, yeah. it's that handwritten thing because we've become too complacent. I think that's a great point to take away for anyone who's listening is write yeah. some letters. Get yeah. to know your people and know yeah. who they are. They're not just numbers on a board. They're, they're humans just like you and I. And that's, yeah. a, that's a very cool way. So how do you build and maintain the quality necessary to succeed in this type of business? And maybe it's, uh, maybe I'll shift over to the restaurant side. I know you were the logistics and distribution side, but let's shift over to the restaurant side. Cause I've got a restaurant tour background as well. I spent 13 years running. Oh, that's great. Yeah. That's right. and I understand portion control. I understand quality control. What does it take to maintain that quality so that you're putting out a great product to the consumer every time? What does it take? It, it, to me, it's a, it's a couple of things. One is, and, and I did run the R&D area of, the, of CC's for a number of years. And you got to eat I, a lot I, of pizza. I, yeah, there would be days I would come home and, you know, my wife would have dinner on the table and be, oh my gosh, I had five pizzas this afternoon. Uh, you know, but um, yeah, so it's, you know, um, from that standpoint, that with the R&D section, uh, just keeping an eye on all the products, we would do taste tests regularly. We would do, I, I had suppliers that used to tell me, you know, their biggest thing was see if you can stump Bob. You know, know your product well enough that when somebody's trying to match your product, you know, 99 times out of 100, they would say, we've got a match for it. I would take a taste of the two of them and go, that's ours, that's yours. And like, How do you know that? It's just knowing your product and knowing the consistency. I would make trips out to... Uh, okay. A lot of our suppliers to get to know them, uh, make sure that they know once, once they've proven themselves, um, you know, work well with them. I mean, get, get, give them, give them some rope, give them some leeway. Uh, we had one supplier that um, very, it was a tomato, a, a pizza sauce supplier. So obviously a huge supplier to ours. They went into some financial difficulties okay. and I contacted them and said, look, you've been a long time supplier to, to us. If this would help you, you know, I know you got a lot of suppliers, a lot of companies, but if this would help you, when we get a shipment in, rather than our typical, I forgot what the terms were, net 15, net 30, whatever it was, terms, if it would help you, 
when we receive the product, I will cut you a check immediately. And you know, our terms will be net one, basically, if this wow. will help you get through this, this tight spot. They said, no, you know, that's okay. You don't need to do that. But you can imagine how far that went with them. That, I mean, that was talked about throughout the organization that CC's called and cared about us as a supplier so much that they were willing to give up their terms to say, we're going to pay you immediately to help you out of this bind if that's what you need. So those are the type of things that, that I would try to do. And that's, you know, that sounds like it's, and we look at it today and we look at our, where we live, what we do, community. And then you become a community with your suppliers, with right. your employees, with your vendors, um, and with your, even with your customers. So mm -hmm. I think community is such a powerful concept. Yeah. And to create that, so that was, that sounds like one of the ways you did it. What are, what are some other ways that you can build and keep community within an organization? I mean, that was a great example. Yeah, well, that type of thing that the, you know, we had a supplier of the year that we would bring to our, our uh, convention every year and, and honor them. I mean, that was a big step too, to be able to have them, because these guys work behind the scenes. I mean, they don't, people don't know who our pizza sauce manufacturer is or cheese manufacturer sure. is or things like that. But when you've got that type of relationship with them, where like the other one I was saying, where, you know, you ask them if they, they want to cut the terms to, to help them out, you can bet that we're going to be the top of their list if there's ever any kind of product shortage or things like that. So they're going to be watching out for us. And in, in turn, we're going to be able to say, hey, you know, yeah, we're going to, we're going to honor you uh, in front of our, uh, all of our franchisees. And, and again, it's getting back to making them feel like people, not, you know, your supplier number 742, you're, Joe Jones that supplies this very important product to us. And it, I mean, you take that to the other side too. That's one of the things I always told our truck drivers is you're not just moving boxes. You're helping somebody's livelihood. When you make a delivery to them, you know, number one, because a lot of times we would deliver at night anyway, but I mean, mm -hmm. you go in and deliver at night and you have just made that guy be able to make his, his business work for the for following the week. Other times when you're going in the restaurants open, you know, that guy might have had a really rough day. It's your opportunity to go in there and give him a smile, pump him up, get him excited about the company, this type of thing. So you're not just, don't just think of it as, I got to move the boxes from the truck to the restaurant. You know, I got to make the donuts. Make the donuts. Okay. It's, yeah. Instead, make the day. Make somebody's day. I make love it, that. Make the out. day. Yeah. That's, I like that. that is, <laughs> that's a great idea. I mean, I, I don't know if you, you, that was what you were, you were preaching, but that's a heck of an idea is make the day. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, if you can make the day of someone at some point, it, I think that's all that can be all the difference in the world, you know, whether oh, right. it's a smile, whatever it is. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like you said, guy may be having a cruddy day, you know, his dog mm -hmm. died and his, you know, you know, his, his car broke down. Now he's and here you are. How do you make him? Look, I got your pizza sauce. I got your cheese. I got everything yeah. ready. We're going to kick it off. I'm going to show you what we got to do. We have stories about truck drivers that would go in there when uh, restaurants getting slammed and be helping out in the restaurant, you know, busting tables, doing things sure. like that. It's, and it's, it's because the driver's mentality was, what do I need to do to make this guy's day? You know, so, uh, yeah, so it worked. Is, and that, that's one of the things that, I, you know, because I've got some things I wanted to know. I wanted to pick your brain on a little bit, but it's mindset. You know, yeah. what? think about defeat, you know, and we always – <clears throat> like to go to defeat right away. Mm -hmm. and I think defeat lends us, gives us the opportunity to overcome. You mm -hmm. know, when you get kicked in the shins, what do you do to overcome it? So my question is, is when you get kicked in the shins, how do you overcome it? What's the mindset that you take? And then how do you overcome those challenges? You know, yeah. what's the mindset that you choose to embrace? I, I think what it is, is, Take it on as a challenge, not a, not a, not a failure. It's just something didn't go as planned. So take it as a challenge and say, okay, we got to figure a way to beat that. We got to, okay. we got to move and, and adapt to, I, I guess the, the thing, and I don't know if this exactly lines up, but the things that comes to mind is toward the end of my time there, as I was getting ready to retire, I was looking at it and say, the driver force was getting tighter and tighter and tighter. It was it was getting very difficult, especially as a relatively small trucking company. 
to be able to find other drivers, uh, find, find enough drivers, even though we, we had great reputation, our drivers talked us up and things like that, but I knew it was going to get worse. And you look at that and say, okay, we can look at that as a defeat and go, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? And instead look at it and go, you know, there are companies out there that I can outsource this to as long as I teach them my culture. And when we, we finished the deal, we put a, a deal together with J.B. Hunt uh, to outsource our, our driver force to. And they said at the end of the thing that they'd never had anybody negotiate as hard for their current drivers as we did. You know, because I was going in there going, you know, we've got to make sure these guys are taken care of. We've told them for all these years we're a family. We don't want them coming in looking at it going, oh, well, we just got sold out down the road. No, it's like because we knew that where we were headed was not going to be good for the drivers long term, too. We, we could not make. Okay. Maintain what we're doing. We can fix this by bringing them in as long as they understood we got to maintain this culture. This is what we need to, to, to remain. And that's interesting is, is the way you use family is so mm. warm and inviting. And again, because you're really, the, you were really the f first family friendly place to take your kid. I mean, I, I can't tell you how many times I took my kids after soccer practice or my team. Yeah. I used to coach soccer with little girls, right? Yeah. I even the pink shirt for my little girls. I have all Very girls, nice. right? And we would go, and that's where we'd go, because it's a family place to go. Right. And it just, I think it transitioned right into the way that you, not only were you treating families, your customers' families, but you're also mm -hmm. treating your your employees as family. Yeah. And that's, yeah. that's a great mindset. What a cool mindset to do that. And I think that's com where community can do. So what were some of the things that you did that kept people knowing what's going on that you did where – you know, everybody knew what was on Bob's head, what's going on in Bob's, Bob's head. Yeah. Right. That's, and as we grew, that become, became more of an issue. And what I did was I, I put together this thing that I called Bob's brain. Uh, okay. the, the subtitle of it was some things you just don't want to see. <laughs> um, but every uh, checks would go out every other Friday. And so Thursday afternoon, I would stand at my desk and, and by the way, that's, I, uh, I had a stand-up desk and a sit-down desk. About the only time I used the sit-down desk was when I was interviewing somebody. Other than that, I, I found personally a stand-up desk gives you a lot more energy. Uh, yeah. And you stand all day, moving around, that type of thing. I found before I got that, when I was sitting at a desk, I would end the day going, I'm exhausted. <laughs> you know, instead of end of the okay. day going, okay, what am I gonna do next? But anyway, so I'd stand at my desk and write um, two pages, front and back, of this Bob's Brain. Sometimes it was about the company, uh, philosophical things, sometimes about where we're going, sometimes just stuff that was on my brain, um, you know, what I, what I was thinking about. Um, so one, of the, one of my favorite. Short letter that day. What was that? The short letter that day? Yeah, short letter that day, yeah. <laughs> uh, one of my favorite ones was um, when I turned 50, and I wrote uh, one explaining that, I, I said, first of all, it's, it's kind of weird to be, you know, hit 50 and know you're, a third of the way through your life. I want to see how many people caught that. But, um, <laughs> but I did, I, I said, one of the things that for me makes me feel the closest to God is giving. And I said, so for my birthday present, what I'm going to ask of you is I included uh, a $50 blank check to every employee. And I said, give this away and tell me the story. That's what I want to hear. Okay. And it was the coolest thing I got back. In fact, for a year's time, I, I would get stories back from people. Some of them hung on to it. I had some people say, we've never given away money before. And this is the first time and thought it was, you know, something that I, we wanted to really spend some time with and think about and make sure we gave it to the right people and did the right thing with it. And that, you know, from that type of thing to, you know, I, I told a story once about, you know, how, my, my grandfather was born within a year of the Wright brothers flying. My father was born within a year of Lindbergh crossing the Atlantic. I was born within a year of the first satellite going up. What's next, you know, and talked about that okay. and just the future and things. Like that. So, I mean, it would be a variety of different things. It's just whatever, when I popped open that computer, whatever popped into my mind, I would write about it. I found out later that um, people were, were copying it and sending to sending it to relatives around the country and okay. things like that. Cause it would, it would talk, it would always relate somehow to the company. 
but um, you know, be a variety. So do you have things. them? Do you still have them all? Oh, yeah, document? yeah. Write yeah, a book. A what about a, what a cool way to put a book together? That's and right. I, yeah. I would call it Bob's brain. That'd be so <laughs> awesome. Things you don't want to see. Yeah. My, um, it's funny you mention that because one of my retirement goals, I've gotten so tied up with other things, I haven't done it, but one of my retirement goals was I was planning on ri riding my motorcycle around the entire perimeter of the United States, writing a book about that and starting with, I, I know you know a little bit about this. I started uh, back in high school, right after high school, I was part of a team that reenacted the sales trip from Montreal to the Gulf of Mexico. Mm -hmm. So we lived like someone in the 1680s uh, during that and start the motorcycle trip talking about that, work through my career, all that happened okay. in that, and end up with what I hope to do next year is go to space with Virgin Galactic. I've signed up for that. So I've got, got kind of an interesting, from, from living in the 1680s to living in the 21st century, going to space, um, there's a lot, of, a lot of things in between there. That's what I, I hope to write a book on one day. <laughs> so it sounds like right now, you're living the dream. You're living yeah, that really. dream. You're retired. You're following your passion. So uh, you, you just said space flight, right? So mm -hmm. the Virgin, you're going to go into space in with Virgin Atlantic, right? Is that what it Virgin is? Virgin Galactic. 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 Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Holy yeah. smokes. Well, how, how much fun Somebody's is that? Somebody's got to do it. Somebody's got to do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So adventures and the LaSalle adventure. What yeah. an, I didn't realize you did it so young. Yeah. Yeah, how, yeah, what a cool adventure to oh, yeah. do at, a, I said, you said college age. Well, we spent our whole junior and senior year of high school making the canoes, making the uh, clothing, hand stitching the clothing, the paddles, the muskets, I mean, everything down to the final detail. So we, we looked like and lived like a Voyager in the 1680s. And um, so that was our junior and senior year, we graduated, uh, and we, was it? June of 76 and then in August of 76 left Montreal and finished up at the Gulf of Mexico in April of 77. So nine months paddling a canoe and walking through a uh, frozen Midwest and all that kind of stuff. And what so, did, yeah, what did people, what did people think when you're coming down the river? <laughs> As you're floating was, down the river. In the beginning, it was the most interesting part because we didn't have a lot of press at that point and there'd be a lot of shocked looks and people going what the heck are you doing as we went further along i mean we were we were regu regulars on the uh, nightly news we we're on newspaper we we're in Pe people magazine uh, outdoor magazine uh, you know i mean we especially through the midwest area we we're pretty well known at that point you could and we, we would we would put on stage shows every night as we got into town. We'd set up our camp, and then we'd go into schools and sit at auditoriums, and we'd get French Voyager songs we would sing and tell the story of... Because 76 was the, the bicentennial, and yeah, so sure. much at that point was geared toward east to west, uh, um, covered wagons, you know, mm -hmm. things like that. We wanted to show the north to south French influence on the, the okay. uh, United States. So, yeah. So that was, well, that was cool the beginning that? of my adventure career. <laughs> well, that's what I mean. It sounds like you've been living a life of adventure for, yeah. since you were a young guy. Yeah. And how yeah. cool now, like you said, you took it from paddles, you know, mm. you know seal skin suits and <laughs> to now space suit getting ready to go in. Now you said that's going to happen when? In ne within the next year or so? I would have guessed it would have been, I would be going up late this year, early next year before COVID hit. Now it's been delayed a little bit, but okay. I mean, they've, they're, they're taking test launches. They just, just yesterday, as a matter of fact, they revealed the interior of the spaceship to us. We, they had a, a special uh, YouTube deal for us and we were able to see so is exactly. Is it going to be like plush or is it going to be pretty, um, uh, I, just functional? It's, it's functional, but it looks, I mean, keeping with everything that Richard Branson and oh, sure. the Virgin brand does, it's unbelievable. If you get to, they, they've released it now, and it's out there on YouTube and Twitter and all this stuff. It is gorgeous. I mean, it's, it's going to be quite an experience. <laughs> well, that sounds like fun. So, well, yeah. I'm going to be conscious of your time, be respectful of your time. So hmm. I've got a couple things real quick. Uh, but before, before we transition real quick, Anything you want to promote from you? You got a new business, a venture, a shout out to anybody? Um, you really want to the, share some stuff you're doing ministry wise, whatever it is? Yeah. Well, the, the big thing that's that's why I've, I've slowed down writing the book that I wanted to read and re, uh, write in retirement. Uh, I'm involved very heavily with three ministries. Um, one is uh, Lifeline Global Ministries, which is a prison ministry. I'm the chairman of the board of that. We're 
Again, before COVID, we were in 33 states, nine countries around the world, and have uh, programs for men, or, men and women, uh, Malachi Dads for Men, Hannah's Gift for Women. Takes them through step by step what it means to be a Christian, uh, how to be a person of integrity, and does family reconciliation. Because if a child has a parent in prison, they're 70% more likely to end up in prison themselves. So it tries okay. to break that uh, generational incarceration. Cycle, yeah. uh, after they graduate, one of the things that we do is another ministry that I'm involved in on, on the board of um, Gene Getz's ministry, uh, BiblePrinciples.org is his. He's got a um, uh, study Bible that he's written a few years ago. And we present a leather-bound st study Bible to the men and women who graduate from this uh, prison ministry. Nice. And he's got a great ministry, too. He, he actually, for every Bible that he sells, he gives one away. So he's given them away to uh, inmates that graduate these programs. He's giving away to pastors that can't afford them. Uh, there's actually a, in uh, uh, Africa, there's a school that teaches uh, pastors that don't have access to seminaries how to be a preacher oh, wow. by using this Bible. And there's actually um, 1,500 life lessons built in there, videos of Gene teaching various lessons. It's an amazing can, can deal. Someone, can anyone just go online and buy it? Or Yeah. If, if you buy it at a Barnes & Noble or Amazon, you pay basically the full price, which is you know, roughly $70 for one of these leather-bound leather Bibles. If you go to BiblePrinciples.org, Gene gets his, uh, he gets it at half price. He's still selling it at about the same price as Amazon, but he's giving one away. Rather than taking the profits, he'll give it away. So, so yeah, I would highly recommend people go to BiblePrinciples.org, take a look at that. The third okay. ministry I'm as, involved as we look below, as you look below, there people will see. We'll have you'll oh, see BiblePrinciples.org will be below you right there. So take a yeah. look, folks. And, and, and the Lifeline and, uh, Global.org. Get a Bible. You know, support someone getting another Bible. We need more of yeah. that. Yeah, and then I'm involved with Chad Hennings, who I understand has been on your program, yeah. the, the Wingman couple, Ministry. Sure, a couple months ago, yeah. Yeah, so I was on his advisory board for a number of years, and he's just asked me to join his board, full board as well. So uh, I have the first board meeting with him in a couple of weeks here. So, uh, yeah, just well, tell keep me off the street. It's not a trouble. Yeah, I will. <laughs> Absolutely. So it's good stuff. So, okay, now Coach Rick always likes to push the envelope. I always like to push the envelope. Uh -oh. And I've come up with a couple of questions that we've heard, you know, your career, how you've helped build a company, your adventure, your taste for adventure. So we kind of heard all the stuff that would go in your bio. I want to know who you are. So uh -huh. Here's a question, three questions that are going to dig in, peel back the, the proverbial onion and, and get to the heart of things. Okay. So here's, here's three questions I'm going to throw at you. So here you go. You're holding a dinner party. For six, you are one of them. What five people do you invite and why? Dinner party for six, you're one. What five people do you invite and why? Dead or alive? Dead or alive in all of history. Okay. So the only thing okay. they can't be is not born yet. So that's a caveat. Yeah. Okay, okay. Um, obviously, Jesus Christ would be the first one. Um, and obvious reasons. There's uh, so, so much to learn there. Um, the second one that comes to mind is Ben Franklin. I've always been amazed by Ben Franklin, and he's he's the ultimate Renaissance man. The, the okay. different things that he's done. It's funny because living near DFW Airport, I see planes flying over all the time, and often think how cool it would be to have Ben Franklin sitting right here and him seeing that and go, "What is that?" and <laughs> explain that to him. But uh, so yeah, Jesus Christ, Ben Franklin, uh, probably for the same reason Leonardo da Vinci would come up. Um, uh, Jacques Cousteau um, would probably be one just a, an adventurer and um, you know someone who uh, pushed the envelope in, in mm -hmm. his area um, I think the last one probably would be because I spent time uh, as LaSalle's crewmate for uh, nine months probably it would be René Robert Cavalier sur de La Salle <laughs> <laughs> wow, that would that's that would be interesting. That'd be an interesting crew. All the adventurers in their own rights. You're right. Yeah. 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 How cool. I remember Jacques Cousseau as a kid. How cool is that? So yeah. All right. Second question. An article is being written about you after you're gone. We all have an expiration date. Yours is like a long time because it's one third of your life. We only live one third of your life. That's right. 
And um, the, after the article's written about you after you're gone, what's the title? Not what's in it so much, but what's the title? What's the headline? I would say something along the lines of, um, he lived life to the fullest while bringing others along. Okay, excellent. Yeah. And finally, so this is something that's a little more tactical. What do you do to set yourself up each morning? What do you do each morning to set yourself up for success? And if you have to go back to when you're, you were non-retired, what do you yeah. do every morning? Set yourself up for success. Uh, what I do every morning after, after I make my cup of coffee is sit back down with, um, I have a, a series of devotionals and Bible studies I spend time in and um, usually do a, I often do a, a read through the Bible in a year. And I'm in the process of that right now. And um, there's about five different devotionals uh, that I go through that, that kind of clears my head and sets myself up for the, the day ahead. Excellent. Excellent. Bob, I thank you for being on. It's been Certainly. amazing. I learned so much today. And oh, I think good. you gave some amazing tips to our listeners where practical, factual, tactical things that they can do to help them in their business from treating employees like family to writing letters to Bob's brain. So yeah. uh, if you've heard it, you've found something good, make sure you click like and you subscribe. So thanks for being with us. Um, is, is there a way we can follow the adventures of Bob? Is there like Bob's website or adventures of Bob somewhere? Actually, I, I, got, I, I own Bob Kulik dot, uh, space and that's what dot I space? hope to dot, dot space. Yeah. There's a dot space. I and, know um, it was a thing. <laughs> yeah. So I, I've got that. And what I wanted to do actually, and I just haven't gotten around to doing it is setting it up where like when I climbed Kilimanjaro, uh, I did a deal where people could donate to, uh, I, I was at that time on the board of Happy Hill, uh, an academy for at-risk kids, and okay. raised twenty-eight thousand uh, dollars when I stood on the top of Kilimanjaro for this this charity. And I thought I want to do that too on the space flight and be able to tell stories of, you know, the the process of getting there and what it was like and everything in exchange for saying one of the three ministries I'm involved in make a donation to one of those and you can have access to that's it. Great so, idea. So that's my plan. I just if somebody's out there willing to help me put that together. That would be good. You never know. You never know. <laughs> That's right. And I love your giving heart, man. I just, I, I absolutely love your giving heart and your kind heart. So yeah. thank you for being on. We appreciate you here. Thank you. You've been listening it. to, you've been listening to the bald truth with coach Rick of the peak performance group, the company that helps people and organizations maximize their potential. If you're looking for a way to grow your company or whether it's sales, whether it's strategy with direction, the peak performance group, one of our coaches can help you achieve that. You can always reach us through our website, which is mypotentialplus.com, or just give us a call, 817-748-7425, and we will connect you with the right coach. Remember to subscribe and like. We're available on iTunes, Spotify, iHeart, YouTube video. Hit like and subscribe to get every episode. Folks, I'm Coach Rick, and that's The Bald Truth. <laughs>